So my name is Vincent, and I, and I like Tracy said, I dabble between technology and design. What does that really mean in practice? I build robots um, and work with new ways to work. And, and so what I'm going to do over the next sort of 45 minutes or so, I'm going to introduce you to a few new ideas. But I'm first going to start with an interesting backstory, because of course you're all interested in my background. But first I want to explain something. <laughs> I'm covered in tattoos, and one of them is actually that I had that tattooed to me um, because I, I never want to forget that everything eventually connects. And the reason why I say that is in South Africa, we had to se separate our companies. Our only company called Signal, which is an electronics and robotics company, and a company called Inquisition, which is a design firm. And for whatever reason in South Africa, those had to be two different things. But to my mind and to most of the teams that we work with, everything connects from technology to human systems to the ways that we work. And so what is Inquisition? Well, we, uh, after working for about six years in the design field, we turned our attentions to designing human systems, designing the ways that we work. And the reason why we do that, I think, is because you're hearing more and more leaders talking about the fact that people are their number one assets. They just don't know how to make the best use of them. Uh, so I think that's, that's where we find ourselves today in the, you know, the 21st century. A lot of willingness to participate with people in, in their companies, but uh, and not a great sense of how to start. Um, we like to think that we make better work by design. And you'll hear that if you've ever interacted with agile coaches, you'll hear some of that language coming through here, but our slight different take on that is that we come from the design world, so we make pretty things that work really well. I'm going to skip that, because I'm going to go to the heart of this, because this, this is my favorite quote in the whole world. It's from Nandos. Uh, it's not the chicken. It's the people who make the chicken, and it's everywhere in their building. Wherever you go, you're reminded that it's the people who make the chicken. And the reason that's become ever more and more important to me is because as technology has become ever more and more complex, we're starting to forget about the, these guys, these people, people. <laughs> it's kind of weird to me that, it, especially as a technologist that has such a passion and enthusiasm for robotics, how often I have to remind my engineering friends that we make things for people, we don't make them for other robots. Uh, and at start with, I'm starting to feel this natural conflict and tension, particularly in technology spaces, where there's a massive focus on the tech amongst the engineering communities and technology communities, and a dwindling focus on people. And I'm very nervous about that. So if anything you take away from this particular uh, presentation, it's one is to have a renewed sense of, of urgency and also interest in the way that people work, um, because I think the technology is, is kind of solving for itself. And so if, if you take away anything back to your desk, it's to think more explicitly about human beings, because I'm very nervous about that we've forgotten them. I'm very, very nervous about them. So I'm going to explain what this all means in the context of leadership, learning, and within the context of bridging technology into both. Uh, and I'll do it as quickly as I possibly can so that we can shortcut to some of the uh, work that we're doing and some of the experiments that we're doing on the future of work so that you can see if there are any parallels or opportunities um, for you to ask questions about how you're working. Because I think you'll find that there are. Effectively, what we actually do is this, though. Uh, we go from really unhappy teams to what we would think are very happy teams. Uh, and the reason why it seems like quite silly and quite fluffy is that about 75% of your lives is spent at work. Uh, so if you think about that, when you arrive at work every day, uh, what a tragedy that 75% of that would be unhappy. What a waste. Uh, and I, I'm quite flippant to that, about that, but I'm also an intentionally provocative statement, because what I don't want you to do is wake up at 70 and think, holy crap, around 50 years of this was a total waste. And now I can start living. Um, and so, so the one provocation that I'm going to leave you with now is that you're in charge of your own time for the next 75% of your life, and no one else is, and no one has the right to tell you that you can't be happy at work, because happiness and fulfillment and meaning at work should be basic human rights. So that's the main provocation. That I want you to take away that sentiment that no one is in charge of your time, you are. And I'm going to show you how, if you're in the leadership community, or even if, you're, if you, you don't feel that you're necessarily leader just quite yet, how uh, you can take some of these principles and apply them to everything from the meetings that you are participating in, to the emails that you write, to the way that you communicate with your friends, to even the, the commute on the way to work. Because I think they are fundamental building blocks to most organizations. We just haven't rethought them for a long time. And that scares me a lot. A lot smarter people than me come around to companies like you guys and tend to predict the future of what the future of work will look like. They say that we live in a VUCA world or complex and uncertain times. I don't have a crystal ball, so this next couple of 45 minutes is me having a guess as to what's going to happen and some of the experience that we've done. 
And I'm going to quickly start off with the weird place to start, which is my, my journey uh, into being led. And I'll tell you why I started Inquisition very quickly. So here's, I, I suppose this is the, the, ten, the genuine career journey for most people, um, who are lucky and middle class and white. So those are the caveats. I was very lucky to, I, was, I won a very lottery, uh, middle class family, white, into a middle class suburb. You've got to always put those constraints down, because this is not the shared history for everyone in South Africa. This is my history. And so I think what I experienced pretty much at all three of these was school, holy crap, that's the worst time of my life. Uh, le learning is linear, it's super slow, I have a teacher who thinks she knows everything, she doesn't because I'm starting to see that the internet has come around, Wikipedia has just started launching, I'm only 33 by the way, I look a lot older than that, uh, working in design ages you very good you. Um, and and she, se she seems to think she's an oracle, and, and worse even than that, she thinks that at the end of every year she can detect the potential of those, of those students. So at the end of it, hello, uh, we're all sorted, that's right. Is sorted again? Yeah. Okay. Unless Durban is not sorted. Hands up. Yes. Amazing. <laughs> we just got to check in with them. This is my hometown, so they're my priority. <laughs> she had the, at the end of every year, she has the, the, the audacity to dictate their potential. So she told me uh, when I graduated grade 12, you will amount to nothing. Uh, imagine being told that. So you're, you are the laziest person I've ever met. You will amount to nothing. Now, of course, you could think of this as two ways she's being trying to be provocative, but I think she's a nasty bitch. So, uh, <laughs> so I think that's actually what I experienced. And then I went to varsity, and I was like, holy crap, you can learn at your own pace here. And I very quickly excelled there. So I couldn't figure out why I sucked so much at school. Um, and, but then I got to varsity, and, and then I had like, these really cool lecturers who said, you seem to be interested in social sciences and technology. Make up your own degree. Like, do whatever that you want here. You can do a social sciences degree, do some comp sci, do some history and philosophy, make whatever you like. And I got to attend some random lectures on economics. And it was so cool, right? Because I was feeling like I owned my learning journey again. And then I started working as a lecturer. And for the first time ever, I experienced bureaucracy. And so I got into this lecturing thing, and I was like, oh, no ways, not again. I'm back at uh, stage one. I'm back at school again. Some dude comes and tells me, here, we can, we're limiting your potential. You can't teach kids these things. If you say the F word, people will walk out. And I'm talking to adults, right? Once you get past that 18-year-old age, I'm talking to adults. I'm experiencing bureaucracy for the first time. I'm coming up with ideas and I'm being told, you can't do those because that's not the way that we do things here. And then I go and I work. So I bail on my master's, which is gathering dust somewhere on a computer. I, I probably deleted it by mistake. Uh, it was great. It was on something about something, pedagogy, something, fancy word, something. Um, and that's how far away it feels, because I've pushed it down. And then I arrived at a, at a research company whose name rhymes with Finnovate. Um, Finnovate. And uh, I got there and I thought, okay, cool, I'm in the working world. I guess everything's going to change. The fast pace, Joburg, I just moved from Durban and I got to Joburg. Everything's going to change. The way that people will be led in Joburg will be primarily capitalistic driven. I'll have to determine rational, rational economic benefits for everything. I can't wait. And then I met the first dude at work. And on my first day, he didn't ask me my name. He said, take your earrings out. And I just thought, oh God, this, this, this literally can't be happening to me. And so as I got more and more weird, because as you'll realize, I'm very strange. I've got lots of tattoos and I had lots of piercings. I realized that it didn't matter anymore how smart I was. It really was just about being professional. And that's kind of scared me, right? Because it endured, it lingered on a thing. And I'm going to explain why it scared me so much. It's because I grew up with the internet. I might be one of the first generations to do so. When I was little, I got my first PC. I started coding on it. I had a, a black screen which I could enter green text into and I could make my own games. But the other thing I started experiencing was this thing called RRC. So we had to go for it. RRL, which is pretty crappy time for me. Uh, to RIC and ultimately into meetings. Because um, that's where everything ends. Everything terminates in a, in a crappy meeting. I'm hoping this isn't one of those. <laughs> so I'll, if you track my journey from school to, to work, what really happened was I was given an avatar on IRC called Vince, or Vince Huff, which is my username. And no one knew how old I was. I was like 14. And I was talking to scientists about stuff I was interested in. And they didn't care one bit about how weird I was. That I was a kid in Margate on the south coast of was going to tell, listening to black metal, reading lots of books, and writing poetry instead of surfing, smoking some weed, and having bras on the beach. Um, so they didn't know that, and they didn't care. And then I, when I got to varsity, 
Another thing started pop popping up, this blogging idea. So around the 2000-2001, um, blogging started to emerge. So WordPress, before WordPress was around, blogger.com was around. Um, and we, a bunch of us started writing politically charged articles because we were churning out mock theses every single week and we didn't know what to do with them. Because our lecturers were so boring, they didn't enjoy emotional writing. Uh, Twelve and a half line spacing, one and a half the... And we were so bored with that, right? You can't put pictures in your thesis. Who does that? Um, and it's really scary. So I started this blog called Mara Fiber, And eventually it got around 40,000 readers. And I was super stoked. 4,000 people were writing for me. And I had no idea in that about who they were. And they had no idea who I was. And so there again, anonymity was so amazing, right? It allowed me to be whatever I wanted to be. Because the web implied that. And so while I'm talking, what I want you to think about is this millennial problem. Because this is the problem, right? Because when I got to work, the first thing I experienced was earrings, tattoos, you look funny, you speak loud. And when I got there, I thought, well, hell, I've built my own blogging and social media platform, which I'm super proud about. So what I'll do for Cinebase is I will build their internet, a global internet for free. Now, if you were sitting here now, think of the CapEx of some random dude in your company building your internet for free, getting users on board, <coughs> starting to test it every week, seeing us swapping research papers for the first time, super excited with himself, and now I get to my first meeting with the CEO who wants to understand why he went over it, where I went over his head and did this internet thing without his permission. So it was like, what's going on here? Everywhere else in my life, no one's bothered to ask me who I am, why am I wearing earrings? It was always about the idea. It was always about in, with the promotion of something really cool because no one told me no. And then I got to my first real job and the first things I heard was, you're being proactive, we don't like that yet. Please take out your earrings, and then warning one in week two for not taking my earrings out. Warning two in month three for building an internet for free. And warning three and goodbye in month six, six because I didn't look like an analyst. Yeah, thank you so much. I, you have no idea. So this is how I uh, this is how I felt every single day of my life. Some random guy would come and ask me to, to form my time sheets. And oddly enough, the company is after it. I turned into this because I, so I helped to uh, work on a social media agency called Cerebra. And I was the general manager for Cerebra. And every day I figured that's what I turned into. Or if you watch Office Space, this is the dude that I interact with every single day. And you've got to watch this, meet, this movie because it will, it will remind you of some dark times in your, in your life. And so he comes around to every desk and just says that. And that's how I felt every single Monday. <laughs> every single Monday. And it, it got me thinking, right? Like, it's got to be, there's got to be a better way. Around 45% of staff in, in most South African companies are highly disengaged. In other words, finding reasons not to be at work. So you see this happening, particularly when in high, largely punitive systems, people go to the toilet a lot, smoke a lot or turn into trolls, like they just disappear. <laughs> they go sit in their car. Yesterday, I was at a company uh, hotel, and I found a dude on the internet, on Facebook, in his car. He had just checked out of work. No one knew where he was. He wasn't even coming to meetings anymore. He had just checked out. And I said to him, like, what are you doing? He's, I'm happy here. Because that is how most people experience minutes. Now, if you're lucky enough that that's not your reality, then good on you or good on the team that you're working with. But that's not true for around 45% of our company. And remember, I'm talking highly disengaged. I'm not saying disengaged. That's even a larger number. This is around, hovering around the 95% mark. 5% of the active workforce in South Africa is highly engaged. In other words, actively contributing, using their discretionary effort after hours to contribute to work. These are terrifying stats. So I felt like shame. Uh, and these are the greatest things ever. So while I have a sip of coffee, I'm going to let you read the greatest thing ever. All that keeps the good stuff in the back. Should I quit offering extended warranties in the fried chicken? I started acting out, weird. Like every company I went into, I just thought I was the naughty kid and I would act out even more weird. Or eventually, this is so great. <laughs> because right, when you're treated like a kid or an errant child and you're continuously backhanded into place, you will act out like crazy. And if there's a rule or a lesson here, if you are a leader, is to think the next time you're in a position of leadership and you're using punitive measures, in other words, well, a little hand. Instead of encouragement or a nudge, you will get responses like this every single time. And, and where I see this most oddly enough is, is in my father's generation. So around the 60 mark, small business owners. And, and then he often says to me this one great story, and, it, and it's a very useful one. Where is all the toilet paper going? 
because every single company I've worked for in the small to medium enterprise space has someone stealing toilet paper as a way to stick it to the mat. <laughs> People act out, and you think you, that you're all grown up, but I can guarantee missing a meeting or being late feels good still. <laughs> it still feels good. And the reason why we do this is because we've disarmed ourselves, and, and, and I'll say this very quickly, as most companies, particularly in the tech financial services, I, and just to give you context, I, I pretty much only work in the financial services. Um, I have a very good client in, let's call them in desk tech, for the purposes, <laughs> for the purposes of this discussion. Um, but we've largely disarmed ourselves because our companies have grown in spite of themselves. They've actually just continued to grow. And so most of the resistance that I get when I say that, that this is how most people experience their work is we're growing so if you it doesn't really matter the profits going up our stock shareholders are great and the scary thing is about that is that we are living in an extractive economy um, I can't remember the specific name I think he wrote a book called Throwing Stones at the Google Bus amazing book um, I genuinely recommend you read it too. but the, the thesis of that effectively is that we're living in, extractive, in an extractive economy and what does that mean? Well, our shareholders are our primary benefactors for all of this work. And what, where are they right now? Your shareholders. No idea, right? So they're anonymous. And if you're anonymous, the only thing you can be interested in is your dividends at the end of every year or the stock price going up. Your happiness is irrelevant. And so the, uh, the other provocation that I'm, I'm going to leave you with, and, and I don't mean to just shock and provoke, there is a fun bit at some point. <coughs> is to, to own that responsibility that you, if you're in a leadership position or you work with other people, it's not the shareholders, it won't come from a boss, it will always be your responsibility to act empathically in your teams. Uh, no one else is going to do it for you. So if you're unhappy, you create the, you create the conditions for happiness. That's my old bike, I miss it so. That's so cliche, right? Very cliche, you move to Joburg, you get yourself a Harley. Move to the northern suburbs, you start calling people China. <laughs> and you, you find all ways to mock people from Boxburg and Burnley and you don't really know why you're mocking them. You just know that that's, that's the funny thing. Um, you'll find me in Parkhurst every weekend. I mean, like, literally, I live the, the Northern Suburbs Joey dream. But this is so important. So, like, here I am, this dude, Shane. I've worked at a number of companies now, and, and eventually I've, I've ascended to management, so I'm very, very happy with myself. And at some point I realized, and the reason why I use this picture of this Harley is that I enjoy taking things apart and putting them back together again, more than I enjoy riding my bike. So at some point I had to come out as a designer. I had to tell my family it was very hard, particularly because they were hoping that I would eventually work at Deloitte or McKinsey, and they would tell their friends, he's a consultant. Not knowing what that means, but at least it's better than telling them whatever that is, right? What the hell is a designer? Oh, my, my son, Shane, he's a designer. Um, I think he makes TV ads. Like, that's been my legacy. And whenever I appear in the newspaper, my parents are like, I guess he's in journalism. So no, I'm a designer. And, and the reason I say that is, what does design do? It solves problems. I've always enjoyed solving problems. I don't really care the medium. So that's my old bike. I took it apart in the, uh, in the first two weeks. It didn't turn left for a long time, um, which is kind of weird. Whenever I turned left, all the electronics would just shut off. Uh, which is fun, right? And I got rid of it once I was bored of putting it back together. So this talk, over the next couple of minutes, is me disassembling organizations based on my experience of being Shane and trying to reassemble them because I am so sick and tired of people saying, talking about the future of work having not experimented with it. And so what do designers do very well is we experiment with live people <laughs> in test conditions and I'm going to show you some of the results of the experimentation that we've done in the hope that it inspires you to try some fiddling yourself to try some design yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and if you've heard of design thinking or any of that kind of stuff, I'm not dogmatic about this stuff. I don't really care what process is used for design. Design is about solving problems. Uh, and, and I guess this is the thrust of most designers. If you've ever met a designer, most of what they do is ideal, idealize futures. If you imagine something that could be better. So you will see in most of these, most of your doors across the organization, there's no push or pull, so I had no idea what the hell I was doing here. I was just standing there doing that. Um, and if you want to do any research on that, there's an amazing study on doors. The Norman door keeps designers up at night, because when you're at the entrance, you just shove and push, and you've, I'm sure everyone's been through that process. Well, designers freak out about that. I've mailed BMW to tell them about my dashboard. I've told people how everything should work better, because in my head, everything's an opportunity for design, and people systems are no different. 
But almost everywhere I went, I was reminded of what I felt at school, which is no wait. Uh, you are coming here to tell us you can change the way that you work. No, that's not how things are done here. Change is slow. I'm tired of change. I'm sick and tired of this. Uh, we've had been through so many change programs before. Is this another one? This sounds terrifying. What do you mean we should interrogate the way that we work? I could carry on. There are so many disappointing no ways uh, that I've heard over the last couple of years when I've started saying, are you sure that's how we should work? Are you sure that's the best way to do this? And, and what I want to do is help you overcome that so, so that very quickly you can see that you have quite a lot of power institutionally to change the way that you work. And that standardization is probably one of the biggest uh, detractors from this, that everyone believes that somewhere else, somewhere higher up, commands and dictates how they work. And so you get fed meeting rules or the status quo gets fed to you, that's not true. And that's the other resistance to this. Human systems don't conform to ideals. So has anyone heard someone talk about complex theory, complex systems theory, or any of that other stuff? I get lost after like, Three big words. But it's best design to understand is that human beings are quite complex, not complicated. Complicated means waterfall. And if you you're in management, right? Waterfall is useful for complicated systems. Humans break things naturally, just like everything just breaks. It's great because we're susceptible to all sorts of emotion, which is amazing. But this is like I, I, I just love these guys. And so I was thinking about being Shane coming from Margate. Thinking about how frustrated I was that no one was willing to actually undo the status quo. Uh, arriving as a designer, having built a lot of hardware, so I kind of figured, okay, I understand how to disassemble, disassemble things. Started working on a lot of interesting projects around designing things for human need. So developing a prototype for IBM for people with tuberculosis, like a, wear, a watch that effectively tracks their whereabouts and proximity to hospitals. Having designed a lot of those kinds of things, I thought, well, if we can do that in the complex world of of hospitals and uh, care, um, and we can make really complex hardware, why can't we start myth busting at work? And so I'm going to show you some myths now that I think I need to be busted. I don't have the answers necessarily, but I think it's a good place to provoke you into some action. Huh. And the reason why I chose myth busting is because myths make meaning. It's quite intense how quickly language makes meaning. If I say something is red, you presume that that it is red, purely because I use the signifier red. I could say that the thing is orange and it is red, and you will say, okay, cool, you, you're obviously wrong, but if we say it's orange enough, eventually it will turn into orange. Which is quite crazy, right? That you can impose meaning onto the world through language. And I think myths are one of the most amazing ways to do that. For instance, one of the biggest myths that you all believe, and I believe it too, is that an organization has a group of people that have to come in there every single morning. You believe that myth. As if it's the rule, right? If you don't come in tomorrow morning, something will change. We all do these myths every single day. The other myth is that you do need two parents to be a great kid, or you must go to school. These are myths we've never bothered to figure out. Um, it's only when stuff con doesn't conform to the myth that we start realizing, oh crap, something's wrong. And we're starting to see some of the issues with the way that we conform to the myth. And the nature of work is, is really built on a bunch of social contracts. You may think that the main contract is that I get paid and I come to work. But there are a bunch of social contracts that keep you from killing one another at work, from respecting one another, coming to meetings. There are a number of social constructs that are at play here. And that's super fascinating, right? Because then when I see constructs, I think there's an opportunity for design. We can change that. Everything can be changed. And other than that, this is a traditional or legendary story. A collection or study is derived from the Greek word, which simply means story. So we like to tell ourselves stories. And so I'm going to tell you one of the best ones in the world. I love this, I'm going to, I'm going to preface it with this. It RPG means role-playing game. So one of the best myths we've ever heard is you have to be professional. And so I'm going to start de deconstructing this idea because I think this is the crux of the matter. Is that professional people don't have tattoos, professional people don't have earrings, professional people don't swear at the office, professional people don't cry, leaders don't feel emotion. Yeah, if you go through all of these, I've been in a company where they ban laughter because that's not professional. Call center agents, you see this a lot, where, in profession, where people are told what professional is continuously. Here's how you'll talk to our clients. This is the professional way to do it. We get lost. Our humanness gets lost and trapped in this. And I find a lot of the leaders we coach, oftentimes their actual problem is that they become professional. And have, have you, any of you been in a really stern meeting that you can't figure out how to connect with someone? It, it literally gives me the creeps. I had that 
two days ago, I was trying to show a very senior uh, executive in a bank. I was trying to show in this university that I'll show you guys just now. I was so excited about it. I was making jokes. I was trying everything, right? I would have tap danced for this guy. <laughs> I honestly would have hugged him or done anything if Voldemort had just said, like, I see you, I recognize you. But it felt like I was talking to Voldemort. It was the scariest thing. He was sucking my life force out of me. And I thought, where did you go? Because if I was in your team, what would it feel like to be in this team? Uh, and what we know from Google's research, one of the most important things that every team, the sex with, successful team has in common is emotional safety. That it's okay to cry in front of people. That it's okay to be a parent of a child and come to work late because your kid was sick. That that's okay. And so it bums me out so much when I meet people who have become professional because I think you don't take that to work only. You're professional at home too. That something is broken so badly in the way that we work that we are starting to impact the way that people parent their kids or treat other people. I wasn't an employee of this particular bank. I was someone that could have been his friend or gone to play golf with him or done something. He just didn't want to do that anymore. Because over time, he'd just been worn down continuously by being professional. Because a serious person at his level in his business doesn't have emotion because emotion is weakness. And weakness gets seen by people. Um, and it got me thinking about this dude that I saw on uh, Chef's Table, which is an amazing show about uh, cooking. Uh, Grant lost his taste buds. He's a chef. Uh, he lost his taste buds after radiation and chemotherapy treatment. I mean, what a nightmare, right? And so the reason why I include this is, for a lot of leaders, this is one of the most harrowing things, is letting go and being comfortable with that. And because if you're a professional, you don't get to let go either. You, you have a tight grip on things. Because if someone in your team steps out, you know what's going to happen in the next board meeting or exco. And that's something I often forget, is that everyone's got a boss. Everyone. And when they go to their, their community of bosses, boy, everyone can get, get their hands wrapped like a little kid. And so I meet a lot of people who are so sad because of that. And perhaps the most important thing about this was that the fact that he was forced by this. Now, that's not necessarily a great story, but he had his hand forced. In order to be a better leader, he had to learn to let go. And you'll see the state change or emotional state change in him. He went from being a ruthless dictatorial chef to being fully empathic and all about the team. Because he understood when he couldn't do it himself, other people had to do it for him. So he was using his staff effectively to taste for him. Imagine the trust if, uh, not forgetting this man has the most popular restaurant in the world. So there are some stakes here. That's one of the most popular restaurants in the world. Um, so, one question. So how do we encourage leaders and learners to be more human? And so I'm going to hopefully share some of the ways that we're encouraging people to become more human. Because if you take anything away from this talk, it'll be probably just this. Is that every time you feel yourself becoming professional, reflect on that, because you're probably treating someone unfairly. Um, and just to remind you, in week two, when I was at Cinevate, I got my first warning. The week, month three, I got my second one. And month six, I got kicked off. And the reason I bring that up is almost every company wants to be innovative. And almost every company chases innovators away. So if that's your responsibility, if you're involved in innovation, adaptability, or growth, you don't want to chase people away. They'll go and start a startup, and it wish it works in technology, and tries to be a management consultancy. <laughs> and I think you all know this, right? You've probably seen this in a slide show before. If you want to be a better leader or whatever, you must be like that, and you must be like that. You must have these 10 capabilities. Uh, or every team in the world must be customer-centric, diverse, cross-functional, hydrogen, dedicated, data influence. I've used all of these slides when I'm pitching, so of course I've told people this. <laughs> and if only, this is so easy, right? That I told you that there was a shortcut to being a more human leader. Uh, there are a lot of people who promise this and does that, and then these people get that. And you will find there are a lot of training providers that do a whole bunch of work about, around managing millennials, leading by example, rapid something, coaching your team, becoming a servant leader. I, I, I genuinely heard it all because I've sold it all. Um, and over time, I realized like, none of this is working. This is ineffectual. Because we have to solve the real problem here. Is that we live in one of these, apparently. Everyone not Buka world, world is. Yeah. Even David O'Sullivan um, and knows what this is. Even John Ruby knows what Buka world is. So <laughs> you guys must know. Volatile, uncertain, complex, eh? 
Come on. You said you knew what it was. <laughs> we'll just go. <laughs> Most leaders are change fatigue, so when you tell them, hey, you need to change something, they're going, well, well hold on, you've had like a hundred of these before. I don't need another one of these. So, like, you hear about responsive leadership, adaptive leadership, agile leadership. I mean, it's getting messy out there. I don't know how you cope with that much information. And uh, particularly if you're like a human chameleon, you'd be okay with this. But most people are not. And the other thing that leaders have got on their shoulders, and most people who work in large institutions, is that they have the burden of trying to predict the future because they regularly ask for six month plan, two month, two year plan, career journey, performance development review, and carry on. All of these are forms of prediction, uh, unhealthy forms of prediction, because uh, we don't have the ability to guess the future. If, if, it's, if, the re if we believe this, uh, then we can't believe that. Um, and we can't dispute the fact that there's rates of accelerated change. So, hey, um, technology is changing too fast. And so, and so what we find is that there's this need, particularly in large institutions, to predict the future, and what's scary is how, how tiring it must be. So actually, recent, I got sent an email this morning from one of the teams we coach, and this lady very excitedly sent me her six-month marketing plan, and I said to her, have we not just chatted? Like, how do you see six months into the future? Twitter hasn't made money for years, and yet it in gets included in almost every social media marketing strategy. It's on the verge of closing. This is the other problem, right? And I, I get this a lot, this like trading. When we coach leaders, some people never take ownership of their work. They always complain about this. My team doesn't take ownership. They don't feel accountable. There's error-laden work. We, particularly in the technology space, we deploy code that doesn't, isn't successful. In spite of Agile, in spite of Lean, we continuously make mistakes. And then the leader feels this like massive, like, it's mostly tiring. And then this other attitude. So this is all kind of swirling around this leadership community or swirling around people who work in large organizations their communities is that millennials have different expectations at work, and so there's lots of training around how to cope with a millennial. Um, I'm a millennial, I don't think I'm that weird. The world has changed, I have not. Something has changed, but some things stay the same. My expectations for my life have not changed. Uh, the world has changed around me. So I had IRC, I had the internet, I had social media, I had blogging. Some of you didn't have that in your formative years. The world changed around me, but my expectations haven't changed. I want to fall in love, and I'm very happy that I'm married. I want to have a kid, that I'm not a freak. Um, like I have friends, I play golf. So millennials, not too different, the world has changed. And so the interesting thing is you're bombarded continuously about how everything's changing, oh my god, and you can't change with it. And so eventually almost everyone we work with starts here again. They wake up on Mondays and they feel fatigued. Because if you're a leader or if you're working on teams and any of these feelings ring true for you, this is how tired most people arrive at work on Monday. They've had a really great Friday, Saturday, and they're, all they're thinking about is on the commute to work is, oh my God. Uh, and I'd say almost everything, so emergent leadership, if you're not a leader, um, or if you're emerging as a leader, leadership is contextual and shaped by culture. Uh, so, so this myth that there's a visionary leadership leader or an enigmatic leader or a idiosyncratic leader, well, you can only be those things when the conditions at work allow you to be. In other words, you can only be a relaxed leader if your team has account is accountable for their work, takes ownership of it, and continuously learn. You can only be a learning leader, someone who learns a lot and shares it. If everything else is going okay, that you can focus on reflection. And so I dispute this idea of multimodal leadership or like different types of leaders. It's only really the setting that allows you to be a leader. And, you, and you'll feel that, right? You'll feel yourself becoming a leader if you're not particularly in a leadership position or management position. Because in some missions, you are the leader because that's what it calls for. So some projects requ require someone who's steadfast in the face of stress. That's a type of leadership. Some projects require visionary leaders who can talk. But some projects require an introverted technician who just <coughs> wants to solve stuff. And that's okay too. There are these different forms of leadership when you bound with them. And perhaps the most important thing, and it comes back to this idea of being shamed in institutions that don't care about me, is this idea that everything's shaped by culture. And what does culture mean? It's really how we work around here. And, and the reason I bring up leadership is because of that dude. Um, we get the leaders we deserve sometimes. So the culture, yeah, sometimes we get what we deserve. And so if you think that culture is shaped by culture, I mean leadership is shaped by culture, sometimes you get the leaders that you deserve. And the reason I say that is there are conditions in American society that allowed a leader like that to emerge. He didn't emerge out of nowhere and went, hello everyone, me and my orange hair are here to leave. <laughs> he was encouraged by the, the system. And so if you think about this, particularly within larger institutions, if you take the word institution away, 
and I encourage you to do this, if you replace it with, with civic society, if this was a society at NetBank, think about what kind of leaders you encourage to emerge, because you don't want that, right? Um, and you only barely want Hillary, so in this case. But it's scary how often what happens in most institutions is the leaders who rise up in institutions are there because they solve an institutional problem that perhaps wasn't that important. So uh, most, of, most of the time in the companies that I work for, because I can speak quite loudly, I would rise up to the surface because I can make my voice heard. It wasn't because I was particularly good at anything. Um, and most cultures today, most organizations, we know that are, should be kind of something like this. Um, so if we, if we just backtrack there, if everything is shaped by culture, and we don't want that dude, these are some of the catalysts for a healthier culture. So a culture that learns continuously, reflects on all of its work. A culture that's more like a network, a labor network, rather than a hierarchy. And so when we talk about that, if you think about the open labor market outside of institutions, people can send self assign into work based on their speciality, and so you effectively want that happening here. The other thing is that, of course, the network shares information continuously. Everything is transparent, and everything moves very quickly. Um, so VW and MTN are great examples of when this breaks down. So MTN, how on earth does a company that big not realize that there's a, a massive billion dollar fine being imposed on it in Nigeria and not move quick enough? It's because they're hierarchical. VW similarly has a team working on diesel emissions in their vehicles and doesn't think, wow, that's kind of terrible. We should probably do something about that. It's because information takes such a long time to get around a hierarchy and for decisions to be made. And the last thing, perhaps the most important thing, is open. <coughs> And openness means a number of things, but transparency, emotional readiness, uh, safety. And I think particularly here, here at NetBank, maybe something that you've, you've heard this P word quite a lot lately, um, is purpose, right? You need to have a, a, a <coughs> line behind a purpose. And so what I'm going to do very quickly, because I've only got around 15 minutes, is quickly tell you some of the experience that can help you nudge the conditions, the culture at your company, or your team, or anywhere you work, even home, toward that, as opposed to something that encourages another job. Because um, you don't want that. And making people like me feel like they <coughs> never work at a big company. Um, and I'm sure you don't want that either. Or chasing away your top staff. Or having a high churn rate. Or having really difficult conversations with HR. And so maybe this is the first place to start. The first catalyst is, is when we talk about experimentation is moving from purpose on the wall or purpose in documents to purpose in the work. And so if you're not doing that, then you're not living purpose. So ultimately what happens is you find that most organizations who are very loud about their purpose have a big breakdown in terms of reality. So the intention doesn't match the reality. And so the first catalyst to creating a very healthy culture is when the work itself is purposeful. And to contextualize this within in your world perhaps, <coughs> is if you were developing a system for internal staff, say the frontline staff, is if your purpose is to effectively, what is it again? Come on, guys. What is your purpose statement? I'm going to test you. That's not. Okay. Well, we'll just go back to purpose on the wall versus purpose for work. There's a subtle challenge. If it's not in everything that you do, if your intention is not to do good for good business in everything you do, then everyone here must feel that. It has to be in every single one of the, the things that you do. And I'm going to tell you a quick experiment. There we did. Here we are at the Arctic Coffee. The Arctic Coffee is the Afrikaans, Tal, and Kins. I don't even know how to say it. Tortier. Thank you very much. <laughs> <coughs> Everyone heard about the spur incident? Yeah. Yes. One much bigger coming their way. And I'll tell you, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to break your heart. At the, one of their resorts we went to recently, um, they've got multiple pools in the resort. And for the first time ever, black families are starting to come to the Arctic Cafe to experience it. Very well priced, um, really beautiful setting. And as this black family came to the pool, the, uh, white fam the older white families all left the pool. Um, and I will never forget that, and it will break my heart forever, because that's not the intention of that company, that is the conditions that they've set up for it to create. They've allowed that somehow. So that's been like, well, of course, like, don't worry, they're just being weird. So like, when they sent their emails into the company and said, black people are coming to the RTA Cup here now, they said, don't worry, we'll solve it. It wasn't admonishment, it wasn't saying, hey, actually, you are wrong, because they didn't live up to their purpose. So this is the first experiment that we're running at the moment with uh, Arctic Coffee, and it's one of the most amazing things ever. Um, you can't see on the wall effectively, but what we're trying to do is just distill their purpose into every single thing that they do, including the policy at the pool. 
and we will give every single person an opportunity to own the purpose because if you're the lifeguard at the pool, you are the lifeguard of the culture. And so if you think about that, every single thing in that institution has to live up to their purpose, that they are for the Afrikaans culture, not for some racist people. And so if you think about what kind of leader would emerge in a place that encourages racism, you can only imagine what the bigger problems there are. So we're doing an experiment now where every single week we're meeting and we're wor working on individual parts of that business to effectively bring the purpose into it. And so there are simple things like how we answer the email, uh, how we respond to the phone. Uh, phone. So at Arti Cafe now, the first response and greeting is in Twitter, the second is in English, and the third is in Afrikaans. It's to make you realize that we are for everyone. We've changed all of the signage in the Arctic Cafe. Every single sign was torn down because every single one of the signs was very punitive. The one sign, and I'll never forget, that said, um, if you feed the monkeys, you condemn them to death. <laughs> That's the language of that person. Very patriarchal, very old school, <coughs> very green in color, sort of like khaki color. Um, and so you're having to change everything. Now, if you did this differently, if you lived this as the purpose on the wall, you just put up a mission statement that said, we are an inclusive and diverse resort and we encourage everyone to be here. And things go on as normal. And so if you think about this, particularly as you are embracing a purpose, and I've heard this a lot in your marketing habits, just think about this, how it impacts and inflects in your work itself. Because everything here should live up to that. If you are doing learning, it should live up to that. If you are building new systems and technology, or if you're managing other people, it should live up to the purpose. It should come into everything. It is not a fluffy statement that gets put on the wall. Or God forbid you work in an insurance company where they walk over their purpose statement every morning. There's a big thing on the floor that has their purpose statement on it. Yeah, you do not walk over a purpose statement. All for a big company, we started deconstructing every single process in their team and started realizing what was actually going on and started matching it against some of the ways that we could redesign the way that they worked. And so there's a, a really cool experiment that you might do after this, is go and with your team now, deconstruct every behavior in the team. And see if there are opportunities to integrate the purpose back in. I guarantee you'll find it. For instance, most meetings are a great place for decision making. If you're about doing good, then you must ensure that everyone has the right to say something in a meeting. I can almost guarantee all your meetings are not run as fully integrated, fully inclusive team. One person stands up, speaks, the other people listen, Someone's taking notes, someone's tweeting, messing around on Facebook, doing whatever they do on meetings. There's also that one guy who's fully checked out of the meeting already, or out of his job. Those are great people to interact with. We do this very simple thing where we map to all the behaviors of the team and see if there are opportunities for design. See if there are opportunities to make change. Because what we found in almost everything here was, oh yes, there were. So the email correspondence in this particular team was starting to really poison them up. What you find is that people used emails in order to trail not as a communication tool. So it was defaulted to last. So we try Slack, we try WhatsApp, we try everything. Then last came email. So by the time you got an email, you were like, oh, I'm in so much shit. They sent an email. And so we had to work on this idea of, well, what does that really mean? Are you compassionate to your team? Why are you WhatsApping people at one in the morning? Are you expecting a response then? Geez, you probably have that too. Someone messages you at after hours and says like, hey dude, I see you on WhatsApp. I saw like two ticks. Could you just get back to me about that system of development? <laughs> I've just stalked your profile, and the, you know when you get the WhatsApp phone call? Have you ever had that before? Oh yeah, that's If you've ever done that to someone else, you know that you just start blushing instantly. Oh, they know. And this is the second thing that I want to encourage you to do. So the first thing is really about this idea of living your purpose and everything that you do. And it's, it's possibly one of the most trite things to say, because I think historically most management consultants have said, we must have a vision and a mission statement, and it must be in a book, and it must be big. I can guarantee I can find it in this building somewhere. You just let me in here with an access card, I'll find a gigantic version of it somewhere on the, on the building somewhere. And it's not bad, right? But I think we've moved on. And the reason why we've moved on is become an economic advantage to be purpose-led. Because people can choose you far better, and really talented staff can choose you because they're aligned with your purpose. But once they get here, typically what it'll do is, if you don't live up to that, the institution will split them right back out again. And they'll leave, and what'll happen is they'll become your biggest detractors. So if you, if you sell what you can't back up, that's a big issue, right? If your clients go, yeah, they, they don't seem to be living up to that ad at all, um, that's pretty hectic. And I've seen how you do loans. The screen, and this is a big provocation, I none of you work in the loans business, but it, I saw someone who tried to give me a loan for a home loan app, and they opened up a DOS terminal, and she said, here's what I use every single day, and it was a little line of code, and I said, that cannot be how you are doing my loan approach. Uh, um, approach. She said, that's how I do it every single day. 
And I said, but you have no flexibility here. You can't change what my loan is. She said, I'm not allowed to do that. And I just thought, okay, that's a big problem, right? That's a human being, an adult. Provocation. No, I'm sorry. This is one of the most exciting. And, the, and where this comes from is a sense of change fatigue. And most people feel like change is imposed upon them. And here's the way to take the power back to quote Rage Against the Machine, Karl Marx, and a number of other interesting people. The way to take this back is experiments with radical intent. Most people receive information from higher levels up. The, this is how we will now be working here. But the best place we find to start a movement is in your team. And if you want to change, you want to change your institution, you start at the team level, it will one day bubble its way up. Because if you can show enough economic advantages to what you are doing, it will be copied. I can assure you. Agile didn't become one of the most, like, one of the best practice by mistake. It started with the team, they obviously practiced it, it became a great way to do it, and some other stuff happened. And the case for experimentation is quite simple. If you are a leader or you're working on teams and you feel fatigued, you feel burdened by your team, you feel like you, they don't own things, they're not accountable, then experiments are an incredible way to kick, to kickstart, to change in the way that the team takes ownership of all of the work that they do. Because what you find is that often leaders are responsible, responsible for commanding the way that work is done. This is a different way to do it. And I'll show you in context of how it changed one of the teams you worked with, an IT team at a, a bank. <coughs> Experiments are cool because they're mission orientated. If you're a millennial and you want to feel that sudden boost of, of value, the best way to do that is to complete a mission. You don't need status ranking up. A lot of companies uh, think that millennials continuously demand pay raises and increases in salary or new titles. They really just want to be challenged continuously because that's how they experience the world in games and online, where all the notifications are, well done, you added a status, you got 200 likes. Or on LinkedIn, 97% of your profile is completed. You feel those buzzes, those triggers, and they start to inform the way that you feel. It also, obviously, an experiment introduces occasions for regular reflection. If you're in a lab or a science lab, you'll know that an experiment starts with a hypothesis, it's a time-boxed um, piece of work, and at the end, you reflect. And so if you've ever worked in a team that does design sprints, or lean, or Scrum, which is a methodology a framework from Agile, you will have felt that sense of, oh, we, there's a Monday we start something, Wednesday we have a reflection, Friday we do a demo. There's continuous learning built into an experiment. And so a lot of organizations are struggling with learning, continuous learning is a particular one, but they need to change their work in order to be continuous learners. That doesn't happen in a class. It happens in the work. The other thing experiments do is they distribute ownership. If you're a part of an experiment and you have been given a role to complete, that is your role in the experiment. You own that role. If the experiment fails, you are part of the failure. If the experiment succeeds, you are part of the success. There's no space for someone just towing the line in an experiment. And the other thing that it does is it dismisses titles, which I know sometimes sounds scary, but a job title can be one of the most damaging things ever because it limits your abilities. It says, here's what you're permissible to do. Here's what we pay you for. Anything that's not on that piece of paper, you have to ask for more money. And so what experiments ultimately end up doing is that they help people and teams forget what they were hired to do and do the stuff that they love. As we found in the, uh, the Arctic Cafe, one of the ladies who served me tea, and I'll never forget this, showed me some of the cartoons she was drawing. She now does all the signage at the Arctic Cafe. Because in that moment, I realized, holy crap, in this experiment, none of us can draw. Maybe you should do this. And she looked all bashful, like, oh, wait, hold on, I'm, I'm at tea here. And I said, yeah, but you can draw. That doesn't mean anything to me if you can make tea. You can draw, that's your skill. We'll bring it to the experiment and see what happens. And everyone who's looking at her stuff is loving it. So they're getting higher engagement on social media, higher engagement on the internal engagement. Because the tea lady makes the drawings. Crazy, right? If you were in the old world of HR 20, 30 years ago, so someone would have come to running to me and said, did you just make the tea lady draw? We're gonna have to pay her more. How will she level up? What's her career guy? No, none of that. These are myths. Again, I get so, yeah, I'm going to get angry. <laughs> the other thing, of course, is experiments reduce waste. If an experiment fails, you don't do it again. It's done directly from the lean system. So we used it. They build adaptability into the system because if you are not, if the experiment fails, you don't do it again. <coughs> the other thing is an experiment can shift along. And of course, experiments can still from anywhere. You don't have to be dogmatic about the type of, you don't have to be an agile team, a design team, a lean team, a blah team. You can steal from everywhere because everything's relevant to an experiment. I'm quite tired of the dogma of all of these things. They don't work dogmatically. I'm a designer and I used to sell design thinking training. It almost always fails. I made these, ter these people into designers and they've become institutions' worst nightmares. I'm a designer now so I can solve everything. 
go back into the institution and start designing better emails, or whatever they were doing. <laughs> and so this is an example here again of the Arctic Cup here. We were running experiments every single week to see what would happen if we changed just one thing at the pool. If we changed the lifeguard script, if we changed the signage around the pool, if we changed the emails about how the pool was used, if we created a book, when guests got into the Arctic Cafe, when they got in, we told them how to use our facility to be respectful of nature, to be respectful of one another, and we measured over time the, con the change in the way that people behaved. And so we now knew very quickly how to respond. But the other thing that's amazing, this is the financial, he, he manages the accounts. This person is the truck driver at the Arctic Cafe. And I think the person out of the shot honestly makes tea at the Arctic Cafe. These people are designing new ways to work. I have no idea what they, what they were before when they came to us, but everyone here is a participant in their change. So you will hear people talk about change management a lot, and I get super frustrated, because change cannot be imposed on people. They should be participants in it. Once they drive the change, it changes everything. I'm going to skip quite up the head. Another tool that we use, so the enabling so the blockers of a culture. This is working with an IT team, where we got them to write their purpose statement and vote on it, and then realized that there were a whole bunch of blockers that would prevent them from doing it, and a whole bunch of enablers. So they started realizing, hey, we need to change, which is cool. I'll send, so I'll send everyone's presentation, so you will have, there are lots of notes that back everything up here. I don't have time to share it all, but there's a lot of methodology that I'll share with you for free. Everything we do is open source, and I'll share the resources folder that we've got. So all of our stuff around designing new teams is open source. If an experiment works, you codify and standardize it. So there's this inherent scalability to experimentation. If it works in your team, it may work for someone else. It can't always guarantee that, because culture is amorphous and doesn't always look the same. But if it works in your experiment, share it with other teams, see what happens to this. It's an unbelievable thing to see a whole organization change based on a few tiny experiments. That's why we call them experiments with radical intent. Little experiments about the pool at the Arctic Cafe have started a massive discussion around racial discourse. So a tiny little experiment that has had a transformative effect. At the head office now, that's all people are talking about. And you can use amazing things like the spur incident to nudge those along. So we would use disengagement or churn as ways to encourage experimentation. And Jeff Bezos has an amazing thing to say about experimentation. If you know in advance that it'll work, it's not an experiment. So I find a lot of people who hear me saying experiment really just use experimentation as an excuse to do their plan that they were already doing. This is not that time. You don't need an experiment to prove you're right. <laughs> so in marketing, we see this quite a lot. Some dude invests, I don't know, I was picking on a certain horse ad. I'm not going to do that here. <laughs> Let's just talk about a horse ad for a second. <laughs> Some dude says horses, and no one says, should we test that with our market? Um, so it's very interesting, right? You just Sometimes you can make an experiment conform to your expectations. That's not experimentation. You've got to go in this blind. And that's why I say one of the most amazing things about true leadership is when you can let go and let your team do it. Because what you will find if you're a leader and you're working a really good experiment, you won't be a leader anymore. You will be a part of the team. Your responsibility is to get things out of the way. I'm sure you've heard of that before. So as a servant leader, remove the blockers that impede progress. Or alternatively, remind everyone why we're doing the experiment with storytelling and vision. Uh, which is such a better place to be in as a leader. <coughs> I'd far rather be that than micromanaging everyone. And so it really comes down to this. If you're fatigued about change or you feel like you're burnt out or tired, it's because you're probably imposing change on people or you're having a change imposed onto you versus, versus being involved in the change. Um, and this is a very cool experiment done on a fairly well-known block in the UK um, where there were two ways to look at this project, and I think it's quite cool, is uh, we were going to move all the team in a dev team, so it's around 150 people. They need to move desks. And so we thought, what an amazing time for experimentation. There are two ways to look at this. Some random interior decorator comes along and puts them all in parallel rectangles, dots it along, and says, we're working on an open plan office now, and innovation will just naturally take place after thereafter. Get rid of the manager's offices. That's what everything should look like. Open places where you can sit down and interact with the tablet that's off. Um, or appreciate the greenery that's plastic. Or what are the other things that are in this particular room that freak me out? Um, or there's the experimental route. Ask the people who are going to change their positions to design where they want to seat themselves. 
And what was so weird is we got them to do prototypes, paper prototypes of where they sat themselves. So with a team of around 100, there were 10 business units. Each business unit had a team lead. And they were currently working in, you know, the classic fragmented <coughs> silo. So everyone looked like a p peas in a pod. So it's the pod model. Mm. And so what we happened is we, we gave them all cardboard and prototyping, pro 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 did a quick design tutorial. So if you're in learning, we just merged the learning straight into solving the problem. They didn't know they were learning prototyping. Um, they just had to do it because it was an outcome. We got them to prototype their new space. And that came these star-shaped constellations where the team leads were put to one table because they said you should be together. All the team needs to be one, at one table. And then we will decide, we, were going to, we are going to break the business units apart and we're going to put functions next door to one another because we want to be closer to one another. So all the devs moved out of their business units and they came into a little star-shaped function. All the BAs moved out and then they moved, they said we need, we need all these chairs to move, we need hot desks. So no one was allowed to have a desk anymore. So they started moving around. And over time, this prototype, prototype turned into how they see it now. But what was crazy about this experiment is we realized that they were obviously so fragmented and siloed in their previous model that they knew that the seating change was a great opportunity to change the way that they worked. Now, if you've ever experienced a seating change, you will know that it typically happens to you, not with you. This is where you sit now. Uh, here's your new screen. And people, people tend to incentivize it with a new shiny cabinet next door to their, their table or a fancy new widescreen. Get your widescreen, it's amazing. Or we've got a hot desk, you don't have a desk anymore at all. Um, and so what was amazing about this is that we just let adults be adults and decide based on a number of constraints. So of course what we need to do is ensure that there's economic impact. We said before you move all the desks, we need a couple of things to happen. They need to improve the efficiency of this team, break down the number of emails that we, we, we are sending one another. Please can we ensure that you don't roll your chairs around the whole day because you need to switch and the other thing is that the team leads don't talk to one another. And we were very open about, them, about that. And they solved the problem in a week. And what happened over time was every week they would do the experiment again. And they would just see if it worked. And eventually, a shape for the desk emerged. Which is so cool, because what typically in, our, in my old world as a consultant, I would have solved them the ideal desk. Here's where you will sit. Here's the perfect constellation of desk. And the other thing that happens here, though, and it's perhaps the most relevant for a learning community, is that the learning becomes the work, and the work becomes the learning. Now, I've lifted that directly from someone I met with an investor, because it's like the sexiest thing I've ever heard, so I just stole it directly from him. Uh, and Bali's like this genius person who works in L&D, and I was like, that is the coolest line, it is mine now. So, I'm sorry that I'm even attributing it. Yeah. It's mine. So what happens when <laughs> you're working on this, in an experiment? The mission is clear, the design challenge is clear. What's missing is a set of capabilities to allow you to do that. So suddenly I had the whole digital community saying, we need to learn design. I don't tell them you must learn design. Then a whole bunch of business analysts came to me and said, this is the first time we've done anything where we've asked people what they need first before we do it for them. Could you teach us how to do that for depth? So suddenly in the mission, everything was becoming clearer and I didn't have to write like, a learning journey for anyone, yeah. or tell them what the learning strategy was. Yeah. But, so people talking to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there I think that's the voice. <laughs> 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 anyone smell burnt toast? <laughs> the learning comes the work, and the work becomes the learning. And it's the most amazing to see that change, because once you become a continuous lifelong learner, you'll always do this. You'll always missions to, to change this. It didn't just change the way that they saw their work, it changed the way that they saw their lives, which was, oh wait, hold on, I have permission to design. I, have, I can actually change these things, who knew? So suddenly I have like emails about how to do traffic lights better, and it's like, well, it's a lot of email now that I get about the color on the walls. But the other thing that they, that they started doing was they started investigating, so in these, in these, these screen, um, windows, they restore the heat. And they couldn't figure out why there was like high churn of the developer, I'm not even kidding high churn of the dev teams who used to sit here. Because those windows used to get 65 centigrade, degrees centigrade, and they used to sweat while they were coding. And they just sat there. And they said, that's it. That's how we work here. They didn't say, like, Dude, please can you move us? It is so effing boiling. I can't even do work. Once we gave them the power to say, hey, hold on, I need to change this, they actually contracted a company that puts on a resin or a film on top of the, the window that absorbs the heat without asking permission. They just said, that's what this company needs. We should get that. And so what happens is that the leader stops being responsible for dumb crap they shouldn't be responsible for anyway. Because the team self-organizes around the challenge. The challenge is now fix the w windows. 
And what you find in most teams that are unhealthy, the leader becomes the gatekeeper for almost all decision making. Everyone's asking permission, can we get the windows fixed? Can we move our desks? Can I have a bigger screen? It doesn't work like that. So one last project to tell you about an experiment, particularly our, our, perhaps our biggest learning experiment, was that we wanted to debunk the myth that learning could be fun. But that learning things about security, governance, compliance, technology, robotics, AR, and virtual reality within the context of new, new ways of working could be fun, and you didn't have to sit through one lecture. And we had some constraints, so you'll see that it was for investing. They were very good to us. The constraint was the budget that they gave us, not very much. Uh, the second constraint was, please don't scare everyone, these are bankers and wealth advisors, they don't really want to hear about artificial intelligence and robotics, because they think that that's a threat to the way that they work. Please don't tell them about that, because this is terrifying. So if you work in technology, you probably come up with this resistance all the time. Um, we are making amazing technology, why won't no one, why won't no one use it? Is that even English? Why won't no one? I got away with it. <laughs> So we created this concept called the Digital Safari with the explicit intent of making it awesome <coughs> because I fundamentally believe that learning should be fun. Because when we saw teams doing really cool challenges, what we did realize is that if you're interested in this stuff, their motivation went up, the number of incidences reported to HR went down, their energy levels raised, and the most important thing ever is that they joked with one another again. Because what we were actually brought in to solve for this team that wanted to move was the fact that they had lost their will to do cool work. And every day they were silent. And we, we actually consulted the team next door. One of the most crazy things ever. We hadn't started working with them yet. Picture this though. All of you sitting on this side. We're watching all of you on this side having the best time of your lives. You had drinks in your hands. You were coding the most amazing projects. And you guys sat next door to room windows that were 65 centigrade. And none of you talked. And one dude one day got up and left the whole building and never came back. Still today, one of the greatest stories. So I'm going to the loo and just disappeared. <laughs> so while this is all going down, you're watching them going, oh my God, Thursday drinks, that's the best time ever. Look at them having fun. That's what we were brought in to solve. So the best thing that happened was for the first time ever, these guys were joking and, and uh, interacting with one another socially, and these guys were jealous. And so that's all we wanted to do. And so by bringing them into experimentation. So I fundamentally believe that work can be fun and fulfilling. And so this is the way that we did it. This room we designed as the room to learn about security. So if any of you work in the compliance or risk space, each one of these screens had a, obviously I own a robotics company, so it's a bit easier. Each one of these screens had a gigantic um, screen. And what you can't see is that there was an interaction point. It was a, we built a facial recognition system here. We built a thumbprint scanner here. We built a voice biometric system here. And we built another system here. And in each route, we got to talk about this we made this the Tel Aviv room, and in every single station, we got the people interacting with security systems. And we got to give them lectures, little five minute bumps, around what is voice biometrics, how do you integrate touch. And these are all bankers. We had too many people coming. There were 1,500 people in this building, all 1,500 people went through our learning. It's an hour and a half that they stood around listening to random stuff about on screen. We had you wanted to experience artificial intelligence for the first time, so we built a robot that they could experience playing against AI. Because no one understood they were being sent this crap every day in WhatsApp about how Google DeepMind beats people at Go, or, oh my god, Microsoft and Google are building things that can beat people at chess. Why not just build it and make them play it? And so we sustained their attention for around 15 minutes talking to them about AI and banking. Not as a threat, because what happened here is you got to play against this and you got to <coughs> practice, practice against the AI. That was the learning. And back came all of these emails about AI and how excited we all are about this particular bank investing in AI. Whereas previously, everything was done in a class. And everyone said, this is a threat. And we don't want this. Hmm. And our second to last slide is with Lord Walmart. Um, we got every executive in the building to come in and do this learning. Because they wanted to not be left out. They had such FOMO. I had to do private trips for everyone at 6 p.m. with families, they brought their families along. Because it was okay to have little kids. We brought a whole bunch of schools into their corporate learning. And if you want to see little children from Cosmo City get excited about a bank for the first time in their lives, there were people crying about this particular bank. And so what we realized was that you can make learning fun, you can make it deeply meaningful, but you could also use it as a way to tell people little, little kids that it's going to be okay to work with us too one day. 
And so you can set up the trajectory like we are for the future and we can do this. And so the most amazing thing about this is that every single one of these kids wasn't treated like a little child. They were told about the security. They were told about what visual re recognition. They were told almost everything that everyone <coughs> in the banking community was. I did a talk on Kenya and South Africa being the hubs of innovation around the world, but being excited about the African continent. And the one girl uh, here in the middle, that's the reason why she's the centerpiece, walked away and said, all I want to do now is become an engineer. And this particular bank has a graduation scheme. And so a lot of people find it very difficult to get uh, people who want to be part of it. So they find it at a school. And I was like, I was just saying, I was thinking, if I'd done this two years ago, I would pitch this exact same thing as a four lecture series where I come and tell you about AI, <laughs> about security. We get some experts in the build building to come do like a five minute lightning talk. And everyone walks away thinking that was really cool. But what's happened here is we've got people interacting with learning for the first time ever and it's changing their lives. So instead of leaving you guys with a bunch of solutions, I'm going to leave you with a rapid fire number of questions that I want you guys to, to take away and do as experiments with your team. The first is how do we create the conditions for a healthy workplace culture to emerge? How do you create a healthy culture in your, in your team? And if it's not healthy now, how, how can you create it? As the number one priority, how do you make work more meaningful? That should be the number one challenge if you're in leadership. How do I make this meaningful people? How can we encourage diversity in the society we call NetBank? So it's not diversity officers' responsibility to make diversity happen. It's your responsibility to make a culture ready for diverse people. Like the earring tattoo guy. <laughs> or the Arctic Cafe. Make it responsible. So you can't come in, it can't be a mandate. We must transform. That's not that's not gonna work. It must be more diverse. That's not gonna work. How do we move beyond profit centricism to purpose orientated work? Because profit centricism has seen its last days. It really has. You're going to see a massive revo uh, revoke of this attitude, P possibly because startups will eat big businesses alive that are profit centered. Because you'd rather work for something meaningful. How can you use a system of labor within NetBank to have people doing the work that they really want to do? So instead of thinking as your team as the isolated unit of work, pitch the work out to the whole organization and see who wants to do it and cause some trouble. <laughs> Please don't move. My name is Dave. <laughs> <laughs> How much you encourage a network structure rather than a bureaucratic structure? There are simple ways to do this. Connect everyone. Be transparent. Work out in the open. Use drive. I mean, you're, you're, you're probably thinking, well, we've got security, risk, and compliance issues. Everything that you, you are seeing here is the only work we do is in banks, particularly in the UK and SA. Everything here has been tested in a bank, and so there's been someone who said, but hold on, sharing information is against blip, and no, that we can we can overcome. <laughs> how about we move from controlling to empowering? So as the leadership community, how do you stop controlling people and start empowering them? As your responsibility, particularly, to empower people rather than control them. How do you get out of that mindset of scarcity and move towards abundance? How can you encourage continuous reflection on your culture and purpose? How can you build occasions into all of your work where you're reflecting at the end of re the week, not on how you did as a team, but how you lived up to the purpose of this institution. So how can you build those occasions? Can you do it all hands, where all the teams come together and say, like, here's what we did that bridged that, that attention with the reality. Can you do that? Can you build those in? Can every meeting start off instead of messing around on your phones with how are you feeling, doing an emotional state check-in to see if you're okay, to seeing if everyone is actually emotionally ready, even meditating. Seriously, we get some teams to just meditate for a bit together. I just do it because I want to F with them because they've read some book about leaders and meditating <laughs> and suddenly it's so great. <laughs> it's <laughs> Don't do that, please. <laughs> How about we encourage experimentation of a plan? Plans have their place, not in complex work, not in technology, not in learning. Experimentation has a role in a complex world. How can you encourage it? And so I'm going to leave you there. Um, I'm probably going to have left with more questions than answers, which is my hope, because I don't have any of the answers. The world is way too complicated and too complex, actually. Um, what I can tell you now is that if you think about all the myths that we tell one another about the world of work, and you think your responsibility is that for the, the rest of your life, the 75% that you spend at work could be so much better if you took an active role in undermining the myths that don't work and making the myths that do work even better, you will have a better life. Um, 
which is why our company as a purpose has decided to make Mondays, Happier Mondays as our purpose. If I can just give everyone Happier Mondays, I will probably die a very happy man. Um, and the other thing is that I, what I want to encourage you as a third thing is maybe to reflect on how you work with your teams and see if there are points and opportunities now to involve them in the experimentation. If you work in HR, if you work in learning, or if you're working in management, I can guarantee there's an experiment to be had. Um, and it doesn't cost anything to experiment with. You don't need to go and ask someone for money to experiment. You can start doing these things today. Permission is really, um, it's a myth that we tell ourselves. So, cool guys. Thank you so much. I hope there's lots of questions. Yes? Can I Oh, yeah, of course. Only if you want to. Only if you want to, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Vincent, let's say hypothetically all of us um, are not, let's say we're not leading teams, mm. if it's in the person that's true, and we're all here on behalf of our leader, yeah. who is hypothetically very task oriented, is uh, very vehicles. adverse mm -hmm. to change, who's very adverse to mm -hmm. this kind of leadership style, yeah. who's very adverse to not being asked for permission, uh, who's very adverse to experimentation. What kind of advice would you be giving us um, as people going back into organizations? Yeah, that's a, that's an awesome is. question. Um, and I've actually recently just worked with a company where it was a bunch of entrepreneurs that have started a fairly big bank. Um, and they're all those idi idiosyncratic leaders who know that where the future is going and they seem to, they don't ask for involvement much. And, and so that's why we call these little experiments with radical intent, is that you can start the smallest little experiment and it will, if it can show economic benefit, most leaders are, are find it very difficult to say no. So for instance, we would say we would banish meetings So as, a, as an experiment. You could probably do that. You could change the way that you run a meeting, just with other colleagues. So we start meetings now with a five-minute rule at this one company. Uh, you've got five minutes to have your say, and then that's it. And we see if we can cut down the number of meetings. What typically happens then is that the leader is exposed to economic benefit, or you've, you've unlocked the labor, you can go back to them with numbers that they understand, which oftentimes is, is money and time. We've saved you so much time, we're that much more efficient. Um, because what they're not going to be compelled to buy is the fuzziness. Everyone's happy. They need to see they need to see economic benefit. Time has been saved, efficiency or productivity has gone up. <coughs> um, there are a number of really cool experiments to be had right, even around ideating, coming up with new ideas. So we would change the way that you brainstorm as a cute way. Um, if that becomes the standard and the norm, and other teams catch on. You just find it very difficult to say no. Um, I know that's not a perfect answer, but what I can tell you is what we find is real change takes place at the, at the lowest, at the front line, often. We find the most exciting change comes up from tellers in your space or the staff at the front of a desk. We've recently taken a branch at a very blue bank, blue bank, a blue retail bank. And we've turned it into a school to see what will happen. Because one of the tellers said that she has no ability to talk to her clients about financial literacy. And so that little experiment was started off as a script that we changed. So we gave her some new skills. We said, hey, now you're the champion for literacy, for financial literacy. See what happens. Her ratings went up. It got caught on amongst the tills. We want to do that too. We want to do that too. And suddenly it just started right. Like the, it almost like spread virally from there. And then it became mandated. Oh my God, this branch is up for me. Everyone else, what should we do? We should probably follow suit with that big idea to make it into school. It's not easy, that I can tell you. Um, but I'm sure I had a lot of fun. That was a good question. Any other questions? Hard ones? There are a lot of soft and fluffy things that require lots of questioning. 